Only one battle lasted the entire length of the Second World War. This battle was critical for the entire European theatre and its ebb and flow dictated how the Allies fought everywhere else. We're talking, of course, about the Battle of the Atlantic, the most underrated yet most important battle of the entire war. We couldn't do this battle justice in a single video, so we've split it into two episodes. This part will take you through the battle from 1939 up to December 1941, when the United States entered the war. As soon as war broke out on September 3rd, 1939, the Battle of the Atlantic began. At its heart, the battle was a blockade, the Allied and German navies fighting to cut each other off by sea. The battle was based on a special kind of attrition called tonnage warfare. This was a deadly game where the British raced to import the supplies they desperately needed as well as expand their fleet, all while the Kriegsmarine hunted them down. It might seem strange, but sneak attacks against merchant shipping were permitted under the rules of war. The cargo ships the Kriegsmarine were hunting were called merchant men, and they often carried radios to report the position of German vessels as well as light weapons to defend themselves. This technically made them warships, even though they were crewed by civilian sailors. The battle went through many stages, each marked by new technologies and strategies deployed by both sides to gain a tactical edge. Geography also played a major role and was initially advantageous to the Allies. Before the fall of France in June 1940, the German fleet had to operate from German waters. This meant that U-boats had to either travel through the perilous English Channel, which was thick with Allied patrols, or steam northwest through the North Sea and around Scotland, adding weeks to the journey. This all changed when France surrendered, opening up the Bay of Biscay to the German fleet. Now, the Kriegsmarine had a safe base to launch raids on just about all the shipping coming into Britain, and they exploited this to full effect. They called it the Happy Time. 9 months of the most successful U-boat operations ever launched. Silent and lethal, German Type 7 and Type 9 U-boats sank 282 ships, totaling over 1.48 million tons in night attacks. In this early stage of the war, Allied submarine finding technology was extremely limited, and the best early warning system most ships had were their sailors' eyes. Coordinated by encrypted radio messages, several U-boats would group up in a wolf pack and stalk the waves for merchantmen. Once they had located their prey, the wolf pack would submerge and follow the unfortunate ships until nightfall. Under the cover of darkness, the U-boats would surface and strike one at a time. Making each torpedo count was critical as the U-boats had few reloads. During the perfect conditions of the happy time, Three men gained legendary status for their deeds in the Atlantic. U-boat captains Otto Kretschmer, Gunther Prien, and Joachim Schepke. Fliegartenkapitän Kretschmer of Type 7 U-99 got the nickname Silent Otto for his use of stealth. Kretschmer once sneaked his way into the middle of an Allied convoy before surfacing and launching his attack, a deed so unprecedented that the Allies thought he did it by mistake. Corvettenkapitän Prien of the Type 7 U-47 sank over 160,000 tons of shipping and became a legend after sinking the British battleship Royal Oak while she was resupplying in port. The attack killed the famed Admiral Henry Blagrove and shattered Royal Navy morale. Captain Lieutenant Schepke of the Type 2 U-19 and the Type 7 U-100 was a propaganda hero having sunk 34 ships for a total of 213,000 tons. For this, he received Germany's highest military honor, the Knight's Cross of the Iron Cross with oak leaves. The success of these men didn't seem to be enough for Kriegsmarine top brass, however. 
All but one German admiral, the submarine fleet commander Karl Dönitz, believed wholeheartedly that the Battle of the Atlantic could be won by surface actions. Donitz's U-boat war was seen as a sideshow, even though the submariners were sinking serious numbers of allied ships. The Kriegsmarine admirals preferred to stick with what they knew, committing Germany's four modern battleships, two obsolete battleships, and six heavy cruisers to surface raiding operations. They also threw in 13 commerce raiders, which were civilian ships decked out with weapons and disguised so they could sneak up on allied convoys. The U-Boat Happy Time coincided with the surface raiders' greatest successes. The most successful was the heavy cruiser Admiral Scheer, which decimated an allied convoy on November 5, 1940. The Admiral Scheer sank five merchantmen with her 6-inch and 11-inch guns before the convoy scattered. The rest of the merchantmen were saved by the heroic sacrifice of the lightly armed escort ship HMS Jervis Bay which charged the German heavy cruiser, creating a distraction. The greatest Kriegsmarine surface raid was also the last. The legendary battleship Bismarck set out with the heavy cruiser Prince Eugen on May 18, 1940. They were going after merchant shipping, but the British HMS Prince of Wales and HMS Hood intercepted them off the Icelandic coast. The British fired first and missed, Bismarck's devastating return fire smashed into the hood and blew apart her aft ammunition storeroom. Hood exploded and went to the bottom within three minutes, taking her crew of 1,418 with her. The battle damaged Bismarck set a course to occupied France for repairs. She never made it. Crippled by a carrier airstrike, the mighty battleship was pounded to oblivion by two British battleships and an entire flotilla of destroyers. The sinking of the Bismarck represented a huge propaganda victory for the Allies and finally demonstrated to the Kriegsmarine admirals that surface raiders just couldn't match the U-boats. The sinking of the Bismarck on May 27, 1940 was the end of Germany's surface battles in the Atlantic. What took Germany the loss of their best ship to realize, the Allies had recognized right from the start of the war that U-boats were their most serious threat. The British Prime Minister Winston Churchill agreed, stating in his memoirs, the only thing that ever really frightened me during the war was the U-boat peril. In the face of the U-boat peril, Britain and her allies pulled together. From October 1940, all merchant shipping across the Atlantic was put under military control. Merchantmen were grouped up in large convoys with several escorting destroyers and corvettes, with some convoys growing to 50 plus ships. Canadian shipbuilding was also kicked into fifth gear, making many more merchantmen and escorts available. Large convoys with many escorts were far tougher prey than the smaller, lightly armed convoys used previously. This alone would have been enough to keep wolf packs away, but the Allies had another invention, a short wave radar set. Designated the Type 271, this radar could detect a surfaced U-boat 5 kilometers away. On a dark night, having a radar in the convoy meant ships had early warning of an impending U-boat attack. The Allies realized the impact on convoy survivability the Type 271 radar was having and decided to put their geniuses to work improving it. The result was HFDF, known as Huffduff. Instead of emitting radio waves like the Type 271, Huffduff listened to radio messages sent between the U-boats of a wolf pack and told the operator the direction those signals came from. Dönitz liked to receive constant updates from his U-boats to coordinate their actions in the wider battle, but this gave away the silent hunter's most precious advantage. Every time they sent Dönitz a report, they were broadcasting their position to the Allies. Huffduff couldn't read messages, it only indicated which direction they came from. In fact, during the early part of the war, British command believed the German naval code, nicknamed Enigma, was utterly unbreakable. They were, however, proved wrong by the mathematical genius and computer pioneer Alan Turing. With very few clues, Turing and his team at Bletchley Park used mathematical modeling and statistics to figure out how the Enigma machine worked. Turing then combined this model with codebooks captured from a sinking U-boat to invent a system for decoding Kriegsmarine radio messages. Still not satisfied, Turing then built a computer to speed up the decryption process. 
The upshoot of all this big brain time work was that from summer 1941 onwards, the Allies could read the Kriegsmarine's radio signals. Every time a U-boat reported its position, as Dönitz requested they constantly did, the Allies knew where it was. This was an absolute game changer for the Battle of the Atlantic and the entire war in Europe. This brings us to the end of 1941, when the surprise attack on Pearl Harbor forced the Americans to enter the war officially. The Kriegsmarine launched Operation Drumbeat, and the Battle of the Atlantic changed yet again. All this and more will be covered in part two. But for now guys, if you want to satisfy your insatiable lust for history, check out our new channel called The Braved, where we delve deep into all eras and take a look at some badasses from history in all these different eras. So if that sounds like it's up your alley, check out the first link in the description below. And if you're more of a musical ear, check out our Relax Jack music channel, where we use some of the music posted there in these videos. And if you want access to exclusive videos and a behind the scenes discord where you can chat to myself and the team members who run this channel, do consider donating to Patreon. And if you just want to join our wider community, check us out on our Facebook, Instagram and Discord. Anyways guys, as always, thank you so much for watching and I hope you learned something new.